Hello there, welcome to a country known for its mountains, lakes, chocolate, banks and neutrality. Can you guess where we are? It is Switzerland. This is the landlocked country in the heart of Europe where they speak four official languages. It's home to Europe's highest mountain peaks and as you can see, some of its most stunning scenery at any time of year. Switzerland is also home to a multitude of international organisations, from the Red Cross to the International Olympic Committee, but famously it is not a member of the European Union. Instead, there's a patchwork of agreements that govern how Switzerland and the EU relate to each other. Well, we're here to look into how that works, and we've chosen to specifically look at one of the areas where Switzerland and the European Union spend a lot of money on farming and food. Well, all this, of course, as another country, the United Kingdom, begins its post-EU life, cutting ties with things like the Common Agricultural Policy, which sees tens of millions of euros of subsidies handed out to farmers, while also setting rules on how they work. So let's go and find out how it works here in Switzerland. Come with us. I'm Patrick Dümmler, I'm Senior Fellow and Head of Research at Avenir Suisse, a think tank here in Zurich. I'm an expert in agricultural policy, free trade, environmental issues and energy. We have around 120 agreements with the European Union which cover mostly economic areas to facilitate trade between Switzerland and the European Common Market. This lot of agreements has been updated regularly and we're running into a problem with this relationship with these updates because the European Union is really focusing on having a framework agreement, an overarching agreement over these uh, uh, bilateral agreements. And um, we've seen that, for example, um, for the stock exchange, the European Union does not acknowledge anymore the equivalence of Swiss law to European law. Therefore, our stock exchange has some hurdles in entering the European market. And we're soon going to see this very same problem for medical devices exports. So we wanted to focus on the similarities and differences in the area of farming. The EU spends more than a third of its budget on the common agricultural policy. What happens in Switzerland. We are one of the countries among OECD countries which has the highest level of subsidies to farmers, roughly 4 billion euros per year. And that's not all, of course. If you look at overall economic costs of uh, the farming policy that we currently follow in Switzerland, uh, we see that we have costs of around 20 billion euros per year. And that's quite substantial for a smaller country like Switzerland. In these costs, we not only have these subsidies, we, for example, also have costs to the environment because we're following the wrong strategy here. We have also costs of consumers, additional uh, costs, because our food prices about, are about 1.5 to 2 times higher than on average in the European Union. And we also have costs to the companies, to the companies that are not able to uh, export based on free trade agreements because our farmers, the Farmers Association, politically is a heavyweight and they tend to block new free trade agreements. So are the subsidies helpful or unhelpful in your opinion? They're damaging the economy actually, these subsidies. We're having too much money in the system and of course this money has incentives for the sector which are not benefiting the overall economy. In the European Union, there's been a lot of talk and political pressure recently towards making the farming policy more green, more sustainable in different ways. Uh, is that the case in Switzerland as well? Oh, absolutely. We've seen in last election that uh, green, greener parties uh, have gained. And uh, we see that also, apart from that, that uh, voters here in Switzerland are more sensitive to greener issues. And this also applies, of course, to our agricultural policy. It might be a bit of a, a big question, maybe a basic question, but what's better, to be inside the EU's common agricultural policy or to be inside the Swiss equivalent? Our agricultural policy imposes a lot of costs to taxpayers, to consumers, to the environment, to even companies actually which want to have free trade and we cannot conclude additional free trade agreements because we don't want a free trade in agricultural goods. So I believe actually the EU, from a taxpayer certainly and the consumer's view, it is better to be in the European Union. Now 
recent polls show that an increasing number of you have concerns about the welfare of farm animals. So in this country, where cows are a national institution, we asked our reporter Luke Brown to go and find out about the welfare of animals here in Switzerland. Cowbells and rolling pastures as far as the eye can see. A picture postcard image of dairy production in the Swiss Jura. For Sylvain Rohrbach, his livestock's well-being is a daily priority. When you work every day with your herd, you realise they need to be in the best possible condition to reach their full potential. They're not just machines. Sylvain is in the process of converting his dairy farm to organic production. It's a major change to his way of working. I was born into conventional farming. I went to farm school, where we're taught how to produce. And now we're having to relearn how to work differently and how to better listen to nature and follow its example. To meet the stricter organic standards, Sylvain is advised by Pascal Olivier of Bio Suisse. The biggest challenge, using less concentrated feed for his cows. When you get to 10, 15, 20 or even 40 percent of concentrated feed, and that's something some European countries authorize for organic farms, we don't think that shows much respect for a grass-fed animal. We have to produce with a 100 percent Swiss fodder. That's a strong signal that we produce and consume locally. Switzerland's environmental standards go further than the EU's when it comes to livestock well-being and land reserved for sustainable farming. Despite that, biodiversity is still under threat. Thankfully, we have these standards. Biodiversity would have suffered even more without the programs. And despite these standards, biodiversity is in decline, so we need to go further. But for many Swiss, that's not enough, explaining why there are three separate referenda to ask farmers to reduce pesticide usage, water pollution and ban factory farming. Their fear, despite the stiff standards, sectors like pork and poultry still allow poor practices. The current system is built in a way that it's very, very hard for small-scale farmers to survive. It's built in a way that large farms thrive. And, and this is something that, that people are not happy with, that farmers are not happy with. Swiss farmers receive almost 6 billion euros of state aid each year, including added bonuses for greener practices. For the USP, Switzerland's largest farmers' union, the direct payments compensate for the tougher rules that penalise conventional agriculture. We have no choice. If we want to maintain our farming, we need to maintain the direct payments. Where we do have a choice is how we distribute the money. Is it linked to environmental performance and biodiversity or animal well-being? Or to make up for prices that are too low because import taxes are too low and we can't cover our production costs? With domestic produce 50% more expensive, Switzerland levies stiff tariffs to protect the agricultural sector from cheaper imports. Some goods are taxed at 100%. For Rudy Burley, whose farm is just a few hundred metres from the French border, those high import tariffs are a matter of survival. We are fighting to prevent imports leading to environmental or social dumping. We cannot accept that we import produce that doesn't meet the same standards without there being a tariff that balances out the trade-off. Reforms to Switzerland's agricultural policy have to balance those environmental changes with farmers' income. With 40% of Swiss food imported, protecting domestic production is crucial as the pandemic has shown. I'm Bernard Belk, in charge at the Swiss Federal Office of Agriculture, of Direct Payment and Rural Development. First of all, yes, we have the best cows in the world, that's for sure. You would say but, that. But yeah, <laughs> and uh, everybody knows cheese in Switzerland, but we have very small farms. So if we compare that to Germany or to France, in average, we've got farms that are three times smaller. And if you compare that with the US, it's about 10, 15 times in average smaller. So it's a big difference, but we produce more than milk and cheese. We produce uh, good wine, we produce potatoes, sugar beet, corn, wheat and, uh, and other stuff. Can you tell us the main differences between the Swiss national farm policy and the European Union's common agricultural policy? Currently, the main difference is that 
each and every farm that wants to access direct payment, he's got to fulfill a lot of different criteria in terms of environment and animal welfare, etc. So there are seven criteria. I'm not going to list them now, but that's very important. Now, Switzerland obviously puts a lot of money into its farming, proportionately a lot more than the EU's common agricultural policy. But, for example, we know that uh, for the consumer, the, the meat here is among the most expensive in the world. Should that provoke a rethink? Yeah, first of all, we have very good meat. That's the first thing. But yes, uh, you know, we do... The farmers, they receive a lot of direct payment. It's about 60,000 francs per farm in average. But we also have to say one thing, you know, an average household in Switzerland, he will pay about 6.4% of his uh, income for food, which is obviously a big difference uh, like in, in your country or in Europe in general, France is about 12%. But Switzerland is very expensive, yes. The OECD has said that Swiss farm policy doesn't do enough for sustainability and green concerns. Uh, is that something that's going to change? Well, first of all, we do a lot for environment. And yes, there are going to be some initiatives, some uh, votes next year, uh, again, for pesticides. But for the next agriculture policy, we're going to have a lot of uh, difference and we're going to focus a lot so that the farmers will reduce by 50% the use of pesticide and uh, more or less 10 to 20% uh, in terms of uh, fertilizer. And we're going to give some incentives for that. And uh, of course, we're still very much within the coronavirus crisis at this point. We've seen farmers all around Europe adapting how they work, for example, shorter supply chains, people buying more directly from the producers. Uh, do you believe that the crisis will have a, a lasting impact on how farming happens in Switzerland? I'm not sure that we can say that. No, nobody knows. But yes, uh, effectively, I think the, this was a positive experience for farmers because we, they could sell part of their product ex-farm and therefore maybe generating also added value. Time for a culinary break now. Not for us, for you. You probably know that Swiss fine food products have very much made a name for this country. Think of all of those cheeses that get eaten in fondue form, like in the chalet behind me. Well, they also get exported around the world with protected origin labels, which uh, bring status and value. Since 1997, Swiss producers have been able to use exactly the same label scheme as their European Union neighbours. Luke Brown has been finding out whether that is an opportunity or a constraint. Dramatic music, swooping images, Hollywood production values. All part of the publicity campaign for Tête de Moine Fromage, Monk's Head Cheese, a Swiss speciality. Largely thanks to its protected designation origin label, a guarantee that it is unique. The very special way of eating the cheese is credited to the monks of Belle It is said that despite it being a sin of gluttony, they would wake up during the night and to avoid it being noticed that the cheese had been eaten, they would scrape the top with a knife. So this way of eating the cheese is also registered in the protected origin label. Monk's Head cheese can trace its heritage in the region back almost 900 years. Today, they respect strict specifications. The milk is local, unpasteurized, and each cheese spends at least 75 days on these spruce wood shelves. Each cheese has this stamp on it. It's like a passport. That means we can trace each one. Cheese is Switzerland's only agricultural product that has a tariff-free deal with the EU. Production of Monk's Head has increased 50%, thanks to the protected label. It's vital for Monk's Head to protect the cheese. We need these specifications. All the producers have to respect them. That guarantees the authenticity of the product and it guarantees the quality for the consumer. The strict specifications do make the finished product more expensive, but the benefit is felt across the sector. For the dairy farmer, it represents a price difference of almost 30 centimes per kilo of milk. The added value is considerably higher than if they were producing industrial milk. 
In all, Switzerland has 39 protected origin products worth 1.5 billion euros to the Swiss economy. In return, Switzerland recognizes 1,400 European PDOs. But not everyone has taken the leap into protected origin status. Last year, the Swiss winemaking sector rejected a move to the stricter PDO label. Instead, they preferred a more permissive Swiss version that allows wines to be mixed from different vineyards. We've had two or three hits from hailstones here. There was a hailstorm just before the harvest. Basile Monachon is part of the next generation of Swiss winemakers. For Basile, his vineyard and his wine are unique and deserve to be recognized as such. There's a taste, a harmony between plant, climate, soil, sunshine, and know-how too. That's what makes this wine unique. The protected origin label would mark in stone what makes it so special. Basile's vineyard is tiny by European standards, producing just 25,000 bottles a year. For Basile, who chose quality over quantity, that rejection of the protected origin status was a wasted opportunity. For me, we're shooting ourselves in the foot because we aren't improving our image. This was the moment to do it. We failed to understand that Swiss wine could evolve and we could create the basis for an image of quality for all our prestigious wines. Switzerland's winemakers want at least 10 years to adapt to the stricter EU protected label, as well as get more help from the state to overcome what they say is a mountain of challenges on the horizon. Well, I hope to see you in part two of the programme. We're going to be getting a view of Switzerland from across the border in Germany and also taking a look at what life might be like for British farmers once they're fully outside the European Union. Hope to see you there.